Okay. Thanks, Alice. Here you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so so the title of my talk you'll see there is um, Interacting with the Worlds of Digital Fiction. And um, this is because I'm going to be talking about my research on digital fiction, but which focuses on the way that a story world and an actual world can interact. And um, when I was talking to Bart about doing the talk, um, he suggested I give sort of a general overview um, of digital fiction and then get, look at an example which um, exemplifies my approach. So that's what, that's what I'm going to be doing today. So the work is part of a larger project I've been working on um, with Astrid Enslin, where we have been undertaking empirical research on digital fiction since uh, 2014. And I'll explain some of that as I go along. Um, but the material that I'm presenting today, I've published some of it in that 2001 article, and then some of it is forthcoming in a in a book. Um, so if you want to read more about it, you could do that there. And the research I'm talking about today was um, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council um, in the UK. Okay. So as I say, I'm going to be showing you some of the research that investigates the way that readers and digital worlds interact. And um, I'm, a, I'm a literary linguist. I'm a stylistician as well as a narratologist. So uh, from that literary linguistic perspective, I'm interested in how language works in literature, how language generates particular responses for readers in a literary context, and how readers cognitively process and respond to language um, in a literary context. Um, but the focus of that cognitive stylistics research is on digital fiction. And this is because I'm interested in what the digital medium brings to fiction and also how the digital context affects the way that readers process language in that environment. So I'm going to be showing why the examination of language is so central to understanding digital fiction ultimately. OK, so what, what am I talking about when I... Uh, when I say digital fiction. Well, uh, digital fiction is fiction that is written for and read from a computer of some kind. And I'll be talking about hardware and software in a minute, but it would lose something if it were taken from that digital medium. So it's not print converted to digital, it's born digital, written specifically for, uh, for that medium. And here's a variety of types of digital fiction. I'll be looking at a few of them in a bit more detail soon. But you can see, at least from the screenshots, that they often use a combination of text and image. Um, or they might include some sound or film. Um, and I'll show you shortly, it sort of ranges from hypertext fiction to immersive video games and smartphone apps. So they're multimodal. And the reader often has a, a sort of overt role in constructing the narrative. So that could be selecting hyperlinks, clicking a mouse controlling an avatar or responding to textual prompts. But regardless of the technology they exploit, digital fictions require some kind of interaction uh, with the narrative. Uh, so the reader can sometimes influence the fictional world in some way. And there's an interaction between the reader in the actual world and the story world constructed by the text. And that's really fascinating to me. And it's something that I've been working on um, for 20 years. So what I'm going to be doing now is to go through some of the history, a brief history of digital fiction. So you get a sense of how that sort of interaction works in different kinds of digital fiction. And then I'll move on to showing you a particular study, which I've done, which exemplifies my empirical approach and also my interest in ontological merging. OK, so some of the first kinds of digital fiction were hypertext fiction. So these are works of fiction written and read in hypertext. They were largely um, written in the late 80s and early 90s, um, pre-web, using pre-web uh, kind of software. So, um, yeah, early hypertext fiction was ac accessed on machines that looked a bit like this. So here's an Apple Mac and that's a, an old old PC there. And uh, these kind of fictions were published on CD-ROM for the PC or on HyperCard for the Mac. Um, I mean, my my laptop doesn't have a CD drive anymore. So um, there's a very interesting kind of situation with the obsolescence of digital fiction. But I guess that's for another another talk. So each chunk of text known as Alexia is displayed so one by one on the screen, and then hyperlinks allow the reader to choose their way through the through the text. 
So uh, this this is Victory Garden by Stuart Malthrop. Um, and you can see on the screenshot that there are sort of two hyperlinks on that. Uh, first, Lexia and readers can choose to follow one or the other. So that's familiar to us from the web. You know, we're familiar with hy hyperlinks now, but a number of different routes exist through the same text. So readers experience the narrative fragmentally with the fiction building a world in which the reader has a say about the direction of the narrative and in which they might actually come across contradictory narratives in, in these kind of texts. So this is pre-web, quite a revolutionary structure at the time and, and lots of writers produced theories and manifestos about hypertext and hypertext fiction. And it was seen by some as the new, you know, uh, revolutionary thing for literature that would liberate the reader from what um, writer Robert Coover in 1991 infamous, infamously called the tyranny of the line. So this idea that re uh, readers have been constrained by the linearity of a bound printed book and hypertext would kind of free them from that. Um, so hypertext is very prevalent now. You know, the web is a massive hypertext system, as I've said, but it was a significant technological development at the time, a very unusual reading experience uh, But back then. And actually reading hypertext fiction now can still feel a bit alienating if, and disorientating if you have a go at these, these texts. And often people, when I do talks uh, around this subject, tell me that they remind them of the old um, choose your own adventure novels, which were published in the sort of 1980s where readers are sort of asked to respond and make decisions about the text and um and hypertext kind of have have those texts in their cultural heritage for sure they're a bit like that but perhaps more slightly more sophisticated storylines um but the reader influences this story to some extent in hypertext fiction it, they choose which path to take but they remain outside the story world insofar as their choices are taking place you know, in, in the actual world, in the real world. So as the software and hardware developed, digital fiction came became more visual in nature and, and writers inevitably were sort of experimenting with interactivity. So in 2004, for example, The Breathing Wall by Kate Pullinger, Stefan Schmatt and um, Chris Joseph was published. So this is essentially a murder mystery story and we have to find out who committed committed the crime. Uh, the text comes on a CD-ROM again, but the reader wears a headset with a microphone, a bit like the one I've I've got on. But rather than having the speaker in front of their mouth, the speaker goes under your nose, the microphone, sorry, the microphone goes under your nose. And then the narrative is controlled by the pace of the reader's breath. So we get more of the story, the karma our breathing becomes. And then once the web became mainstream, uh, writers could utilize the affordances of that. So um, this is uh, 1001 by Lance Olson, published on the web in 2005. It's set in a cinema, a movie theater in um, the Mall of America, and it documents the 10 minutes before the film starts. So um, what we can do is click on individual characters in that in that auditorium to reveal their thoughts and memories. And the narrative explores kind of consumer culture in the US, essentially. And the work uses hyperlinks to real websites. So if we click, for example, on Mall of America here, that takes us to the real Mall of America website on the web. So that is the readers taken outside the boundaries of the 1001 text to, expl to explore that link on the real web. So it's incorporating real world material into the fiction. And... Um, Another one of my favourite works is um, Nightingale's Playground by Judy Alston and Andy Campbell. And this is quite an eerie first person web based narrative. It explores the relationship between two school friends and the reader uncovers the story via navigating this three dim dimensional world, sort of interacting with objects and um, uh, you sort of get fragments of fragments of the narrative coming up. And you can sort of pan around the room and explore the fictional worlds uh, uh, visually there. So you can see these words, well, uh, works have a much greater visual depth than some of those earlier hypertext fictions I showed you. And they make quite inventive use of interactivity. They don't necessarily merge the actual world and, and, and story world, but they, they're giving reader a, a kind of role and a sort of 
maybe more pronounced access in, into that visual, the visual, uh, visual access at least. Uh, right. So, and uh, while web-based fiction is certainly still being produced and hypertext fictions are definitely being produced, writers using uh, software like Twine instead of the kind of older story space um, software, but digital fiction is inevitably sort of utilizing the latest technology. So some work is produced for apps, for smartphones and tablets and um, touch screen navigation is therefore utilized for navigation. So you can see on the second image there, you can sort of chase words around the page and on the third, the page sort of opens up and shuts down like a concertina using the pinching uh, motion. So there's an engagement with the materiality of the interface there. And sometimes that kind of bleeds into the story world itself. And of course, your phone is something, you know, you people have it on them a lot. You're very familiar with that. And that's significant. I'll, I'll be coming on to that um, shortly in my main ex, my main case study. And then taken to the sort of next step, um, virtual reality offers a sort of deeper, more immersive engagement with digital worlds. Um, and this is being harnessed for storytelling. So in this kind of vi virtual reality experience, the, the user, the reader player becomes disconnected from one world. So that's our real world and sort of deeply placed in another digital space. So in this um in this image, I'm experiencing um, a VR fiction by Andy Campbell and Judy Elston. Again, this is called Wallpaper. Um, and they originally de developed this as a kind of um, web-based piece, an on-screen piece, and they have now developed it as a VR story. So it's using sort of text, image, sound. It allows you to sort of um, play the first per plays the first person, the protagonist. Um, entering entering their world so here there's a kind of disconnection from the real world and full immersion in the story world so I hope that gives a kind of brief sense of uh, the extent to which readers can interact with digital fiction and the different scales um, of involvement interaction and, and, and immersion uh, okay so as a literary linguist and a narratologist, I am analyzing the way that language is used in these texts alongside the other modes, you know, sound, image, etc., to construct story worlds. And crucially, I'm interested in how interactivity contributes to world building. So how does the reader influence the fictional world? How does interactivity work with or against immersion? And in what ways does the digital world interact with the real world? So does it feel like we're entering a completely different space as in VR? Or does the digital text play with the boundary between reality and, and fiction, as we'll see in my example uh, coming up? Okay, so with those questions in mind, so the focus of the rest of my talk is on the empirical reader response research I've been doing for the past uh, 10 years with um, Astrid Enslin, Lyle Skeynes, Isabel van der Bom, and Jen Smith uh, as part of a project that ran uh, from 2014 to 2017. Um, and we've been working on it since then uh, called the Reading Digital Fiction Project. And this work was conducted within the field of empirical literary studies, cognitive stylistics, as I talked about before, um, and cognitive narratology. So um, this is looking at how readers cognitively process text by combining linguistic and narratological analysis with insight from the cognitive sciences um, uh, to show how texts generate particular responses in readers. So we've been working with readers and doing reader response studies um, in that context. So we've been considering whether existing literary linguistic and narratological theories can account for reader responses to digital fiction. And sometimes they don't because the theory has often been developed in relation to print. So we're developing new theories so they can more appropriately account for the features used in digital media. So things like, you know, interactivity. And you can see the areas that we've focused on um, and the publications that have, have come out of this. And that this is all coming together in a new book called Reading Digital Fiction, Narrative Cognition, Mediality, which is coming out um, with Routledge 
soon, very soon. I've been in touch with the publishers coming very soon, either the end of this year or the beginning of next. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on um, ontological ambiguity in an app fiction today. Astrid, I think, in previous uh, iteration of this series, focused on the study on virtual reality, if you're in interested in that one. OK, so in the study I'm looking at today, I um, focused on a digital fiction app for smartphones called Karen. And this was created by a UK based artist collective called um, Blast Theory. Uh, it was released in 2015 and the app is installed like any other app on a smartphone uh, via an app store. And when it's installed on your device, it sort of appears there alongside all your other apps. So here it is on my phone. So this is Karen and um, the app uses full motion video to construct a fictional world around Karen, who's assigned as the reader's life coach. And over the course of eight days, readers receive 17 short video calls around three to five minutes from Karen and they resemble kind of Zoom calls or FaceTime calls. So I'm actually just going to show you a clip of our first encounter with Karen to give you a sense of what Karen can be like. So uh, this is episode one. This is the first time that we meet Karen. Let's hope this works. No, we, we can't hear it. We can't hear any any sound, Alice. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh it could it be um one of the uh I think it's one of the settings on Zoom that you can hear audio from the computer. Could that be something? <clears throat> but I think it relates to uh all of us, people in the uh in the audience on Zoom and here in the room oh oh okay okay so you just can't hear it okay that's weird never mind never mind i'll just keep playing it so you just get a sense of what she's like and, and what the interface looks like uh yeah it's not it's not essential i suppose okay so Okay, so you couldn't hear it, but you got a sense of Karen. Uh, and just to remind you, she's supposed to be our life coach, right? So uh, as you can see, she's not particularly professional, and uh, we'll see we'll see a bit more of that in the minute. Um, uh, I don't know about you, if I was going to see a life coach, I wouldn't expect that as our first kind of meeting. Okay, so um, so as you also will have seen. In the video call, Karen often asks us questions that we must answer. So in the clip, uh, she says, how are you? And we have to select an answer from a number of options that she gives to us. And then Karen res actually responds in some way to our responses. So if you select this feels weird, you get a response from her that says, oh, weird in a good way, though, right? Um. In other cases, she sort of asks us to enter free text. So in this example, you know, she asks us, uh, you know, what would you like me to call you? And um, at the e at the end of each call, we're told what time our next 
um, interaction with her is going to be. So here it says uh, today at 11 o'clock. And when the time comes, we get a text from Karen to say she's ready. Okay. And the notifications that we get from the app mirror notifications we'd receive from any other app. And in fact, they appear alongside notifications from real people. So here's a notification on my smartphone appearing alongside, you know, text from my real friends and a missed call and um, uh, from a real number. And the app intermittently and sometimes unpredictably intrudes on our on our on our real world. We can't dictate when Karen's going to message us, and if we don't call her back when we're supposed to, she gets quite persistent. She she texts you multiple times, so it's it's quite hard to ignore her. And as we give information to Karen, we can sometimes see it used um, intelligently. So here we can see. Um, Hang on a minute. Yeah, here we can see uh, Karen using my name, um, Alice, which, you know, I told her what my name was, and also asking about Rob, which was the name of my significant other, which I gave to her when she asked when she asked me who my significant other was. So throughout, Karen is using the information that we give, and she does so in a way that suggests we're having a kind of meaningful dialogue. And while that previous clip showed Karen in a non-professional mode, um, you know, she's she's in sort of casual clothes and she looks a bit kind of disorganized and chaotic. There are many episodes where she does act more like a professional life coach. So you can see this is her more professional persona. She's dressed more smartly. Um, uh, she she she's more she's she's more organized in these these sessions and she asks more sort of life coach type questions. So, you know, which area is most important for you to work on? And so there's this slipping in and out of informality and formality, as well as personal professional throughout the experience. And we're going to unpick that uh, later. But over the course of the eight days, the interactions become less about us and what we want to focus on and more about Karen as she confides sort of inappropriate, quite intimate details about herself. So she, can't, she starts to call us for more domestic as opposed to professional settings and when she's in the most informal mode, she engages us in really inappropriate subjects. So she's asking us whether she should pursue uh, something with this 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 guy. Should I go for it? And the subsequent notification when we respond to that uh, later is, uh, yeah, we should do a session. It's really informal, sounds confessional, as though it's perhaps Karen that needs our help rather than her helping us. So there's an increasing mix of highly informal and professional registers, both in terms of her visual appearance, the role that Karen assumes and some of the language that she uses. So Karen, rather than um, it's yeah, Karen's life journey rather than ours, that becomes the predominant focus of the narrative. But this is intermixed with her popping up in this quite professional capacity. Towards the end of the uh towards the end of the serial uh, Karen tells us that she's been analyzing our data in a notification and in a subsequent call she tells us something about what she's learned so here she says you're 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 already good at getting over problems and dealing with the present um so I won't tell you what happens at the end in case you want to have a go at yourself but um, we're left with some ambiguity as to what 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 happens to Karen so my own response to this experience was that it felt uncannily real and there was this interesting interplay between what I knew was a fictional experience but what appeared to be a, a, a kind of uncannily real interaction. And my response was shared by some of the people who reviewed the app online. So you can see in this first example, so I'll just move my thing out of the way, um, they give it uh, five stars. Right. And the evaluation is partly based on the fact that the experience feels real. And the second review talks about the intimacy they find in the app and the way that Karen seems to invade their privacy. It's entitled It All Feels Too Real, though, as if there's an uncomfortableness about the level of authenticity they've experienced, even though they loved it. So in order to explore these responses further, I undertook a reader response study and the methodology followed Bortolucci and uh, Dixon's approach by analysing textual features and reader constructions. So this means combining an analysis of the text itself 
but also an analysis of reader responses to that text because the responses can tell us something about how that um, experience is conceptualized by readers. And in this particular reader response study, we worked with um, reading groups. So these are kind of book groups, also known as book groups. So these are groups of people that meet on a regular basis, um, either groups, groups of friends or people have joined a book group. And they normally meet, you know, once every month or so to discuss a novel that they've picked. So we asked them, we approached reading groups as part of the a part of the study and we asked them to have a go at the app. And so they they did that individually and then they came together in their normal environment. So it, somebody's house or in a cafe to discuss the app as they would if they were discussing a novel as part of the book group. And we used um, five reading groups in total. And um, these were located in cities in the north of England. And we asked participants to start Karen on the same day. So they would sort of finish it on the same day, a, a day or so before they were scheduled to meet. And they met as usual. We, we There was no researcher present. So this um, conforms to sort of naturalistic study. So this is where you try and replicate the kind of normal conditions that they would be reading and discussing a text in without with minimal re uh, researcher intervention. So they then um, recorded their discussion on a, bit, a dictaphone and we and we transcribed that discussion. And then we analysed those discussions um, for looking for, for themes, a thematic analysis, basically, using a qualitative software tool called Envivo. Um, so we're looking at what the themes that came up in across those discussions and looked at the language uh, that the, the readers were using and what that revealed about their relationship to to Karen and, and and the fictional world. Okay, so let's have a look at what we found out. So the app de definitely uh, generated strong and polarized responses, right? So um, some participants absolutely hated the experience, right? So Dennis said it was irritating and difficult, very unbelievable. Others uh, found the character unbelievable. So Elaine says, um, if the actress was meant to be hugely irritating and over the top, she did her job. And here we see Elaine is talking about the actress, right, rather than the character. She, she, she's viewing the experience very much as an artifact that's been created in the real world rather than something that she's kind of a world that she's uh, immersed in at that point. And these people didn't just not they just they just didn't like the experience and they engaged with it only because they had to for the study. And while these are negative responses, they, they're still incredibly useful to us because analysing them in more detail has allowed us to explore the relationship between the, uh, enjoyment and immersion and believability and immersion. And um, so while they might imply disengagement with the fiction, um, as one of my examples to show, so actually really important uh, part of the research, nevertheless. So irrespective of whether participants liked the experience or not, you know, all of them reported sort of quite strong res responses to the character Karen in their in their book group discussions. So typical responses were that she was, um, you know, not surprisingly unprofessional. Others note her poor emotional state, describing her as unhinged and desperate, wanting reassurance and a bit of a train wreck. And her volatility was also noted in that she was a completely different person from one day to the next. Some participants, though, felt so sorry for Karen that they felt themselves becoming more involved. And some of the responses indicated a strong engagement with Karen, even though they clearly found her annoying. So, um, you know, for example, uh, here, here Annie says, I was involved, even though I was, even though she's weird. So note here the use of the present tense, she, she is weird, which suggests that Karen still exists, right? So she's not part of a past experience, but is conceptualized as having an enduring property, you know, of weirdness. And some readers also felt a very strong emotional responsibility for Karen, experiencing feelings of guilt about their own behavior in relation to her. So here Laura says, I actually started to feel responsible for her unraveling. So here we can see the interactive function required of the reader in terms of them having to respond to Karen's questions and appeals for help causes a significant feeling of unease for Laura, even though, um, you know, she knows the experience is fictional. She she feels a strong emotional burden. And in addition to readers feeling responsible for Karen during interactions with her, some also indicated that their effective responses had a sort of greater longevity. So Laura, again, for example, reports that 
Her connection with the fictional world continues in between episodes. She says, I was sort of thinking about it in between, actually, with um, Annie agreeing. And others in that same group reported thoughts about Karen materialising when they weren't in direct contact with the app. So Nancy says, yeah, I mean, because when I'm at work, I'm like, Karen, and everybody laughs. You're not bothered about me anymore. So here we see Nancy's anticipating the phone call from Karen and, and, and Kim uses the second person, you, to address Karen, joking about being rejected by her as though she, you know, as though she actually exists somewhere. Also significant is that some participants experienced emotion uh, after the entire thing uh, was over. So Nancy says, you know what? I think I felt a whole host of emotions if I'm being really honest. Yeah, me too. I'm glad it's over, but I'm kind of not really because I miss her. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. And I love this example because it's almost like a confession. This came right at the end of their discussion. So Nancy hedges that she's kind of not glad it's over, but she's obviously really not glad it's over. And looking at the language used by Nancy, she uses the past tense that she felt a whole host of emotions, but she shifts temporally into the present using miss to describe the way she feels now. But again, this implies that Karen still exists somewhere. It's the relationship that's gone, not necessarily Karen. And the other participants sort of concur quite enthusiastically with that, indicating they might have felt the same way. And it wasn't just people who felt fond of Karen who had that related experience afterwards. So Dennis uh, says here, every time I hear something on the radio, I think I can hear her talking. Oh, and I hear I hear that trippy music she was playing. So Dennis and Judy didn't like the experience overall. And I showed you a quote from Dennis earlier. He said he found it irritating and difficult, but he still had that it still had this long term effect on him. So that that and that is not necessarily related to enjoyment. And finally, some participants explicitly commented on how they felt Karen or the fictional world was intruding into their into their actual world, their real world. So, uh, for example, Kim says it came into your life. And Jennifer, I just felt like somebody was actually interfering in my life. And the metaphors they're using here imply intrusion. Right. Um, so uh, the effect of it feeling too real is part of the fun. Or the, and or the uncomfortableness with the app. So how can we explain these responses to Karen? What textual features might be driving this? Um, so linguistically and visually, Karen does a lot to draw an emotional response uh, uh, from us. And I was going to show you another clip to illustrate how that works. I'm still going to do that, but you're probably not going to be, be able to hear it. So... Um, I'm just going to show you the visuals, what she looks like, and then I can actually read out. I can read out the um, the, the transcript. So <clears throat> this is in the middle of what's supposed to be a life coaching session for us, but Karen sort of takes a sidestep into talking about her own life, and this is again quite typical of her. So there's a move from Karen being self-assured to being uncertain, and this is signalled visually and linguistically. So let me just. Okay, so I'm assuming you, you can't hear that. Um, so here's the uh, We actually transcript. hear them. Oh, you can? Yeah. Okay, let's go for it then. universe that's driven purely by love. And when I'm happy, I get on with those people. I like working with people. It's up to me to make it happen, right? Okay, so how how does um uh, Karen forge attempt to forge a relationship with the reader here? So well in the first part Karen looks directly into the camera and she doesn't she doesn't look away in that in that first section. And in terms of the language she uses, Karen uses what we would call strong epistemic modality. So this is language that de demonstrates a high level of certainty. 
So it includes unhedged copulas like it's, it is, or that is, as opposed to something like it might be or it could be. Um, and the modal lexical verb I know and a series of declarative clauses or statements. So this shows self-assurance and confidence in what's been said in that first bit. But she then switches into a more sort of uncertain and contemplative style. So she looks away from the camera as if she's unsure about what she's about to say next. She also begins this part of the discourse with the modal lexical, uh, lexical verb, I know, but the overall language use suggests uncertainty. So the discourse marker, well, followed by a pause, suggests she's hedging what she's about to say. And she uses weak ep epistemic modality. Um, so this is... Uh, modality that indicates uncertainty right with things like maybe and sometimes which imply less certainty than the unmodalized assertions uh, before and when she does use unmodalized constructions like i am lucky as opposed to something like i'm probably lucky we're not she's not necessarily convincing that she believes that and she also ends with a tag question right for the reader, suggesting she's uncertain about the statement she's just made. Her belief that I get on with most people also seems deluded because given her behaviour, it's likely that most readers have been experiencing some of the frustrations with her that we've seen in the reader response data and wouldn't necessarily get on with her. So there's this mismatch between how we're experiencing her and how Karen presents herself, or at least like how she'd like herself to be, even if she knows she's not. And this makes her seem vulnerable. So linguistically, she moves from being confident to unsure. And a stylistic analysis can therefore sort of unpick how Karen's language use leads to some of our participants' responses, such as Laura, who started to feel responsible for her, but also the participants who observed that she sort of wanted reassurance and is a completely different person from one day to the next. So this language use and behavior creates a character that's very memorable, very affecting for many other participants. And it might explain why the participants think about her outside of the experience or why the experience sort of resonates with them so strongly. And of course, this is a small ex ex excerpt here, but it's quite typical of the way that Karen acts and the communicative style that, uh, that she uses. So in terms of how the Karen app operates uh, overall, though, we need to take into account how Karen communicates with us technologically. So because the entire interaction takes place um, on our phone, uh, so, uh, and something that belongs to us already, right? And because we receive notifications from her, uh, like real tech messages, the experience begins to bleed into our real life through the technology itself. So it's not just that Karen as a character is generating strong emotional responses, but it's also that she seems to be intruding into our lives, whether we like it or not, via the technology. And this medium specific aspect is, is really important, you know, integral. And also crucial to the experience, is the fact that Karen addresses us with the second person pronoun you throughout all of her interactions with us, whether they're conversations, texts, multiple choice questions. And the multiple choice questions are, are, are really important in terms of putting us in, in a dialogue with her, because if we want to continue through the text, we have to respond to her question. But if we um, respond to the question, we implicitly become the you. Right. And this places us in uh, what media theorist Espen Arseth um, infamously, infamously called a cybernetic feedback loop with uh, with the with the phone, with the computer, with the machine in which information flows from text to user. So this is in this case via um, uh, text messages, video calls with Karen, etc. And then information flows back again via the interactive function the reader can perform. So selecting responses from those on offer, calling Karen when we have appointments, that kind of thing. So this loop makes us feel like we're communicating with Karen and that there's an interaction and even a bleed between real and fictional worlds. So the reader data shows how reality and fiction can merge and therefore how digital technology can alter our perception of what is real. So when Laura feels responsible for Karen, when uh, people use metaphors about the experience interfering in their lives, when Dennis hears her on the radio, when participants miss or talk to Karen outside the app, there's this convergence or blending of worlds, or it might even feel as if Karen exists in the actual world. And this is really significant because it shows that a fictional world can become part of the actual world, or at least 
it becomes harder to distinguish between them, even though we know that's not the case, right? So it feels like it is, even though we know it's not. So previous stylistic and narrative theories didn't really account for this bleeding of worlds because this is completely impossible, right? A fictional character can't really exist in our world because they're fictional. They exist in a fictional world only. And narrative theories keep the actual world and the fictional world distinct, like ontologically distinct. But this is how the Karen app makes some people feel and ultimately how it generates its message because the narrative explores our um, uh, di uh, relationship with digital media and the relationships that we build online. So to explain the effect, I developed a, a new theory called ontological resonance, uh, which accounts for the way that some fictional experiences seem to merge reality and fiction, right? And in the 2000 one article, if you wanted to read about it further, I draw on Peter Stockwell's concept of literary resonance and Otis Guattari's uh, work on game transfer phenomenon to develop this concept, right? And I, I define this as ontological resonance as a phenomenon in which reading, viewing or playing a fictional work, so across media, can result in a prolonged response and aura, in, aura of significance, which is generated by perceived bi-directional ontological transfers between actual world and story world, both during and after the experience. So this concept sort of acknowledges the part that transportation plays in generating response. So readers are kind of transported in the world in order to have elements for it to be brought back into the actual world. So it recognizes the blurring of fictional reality that can happen in texts that play with the boundary between reality and fiction, but also the prolonged felt effects of those ontologically transgressive texts. So in Karen, ultimately, the digital technology through which we interact with uh, with her is the very thing this digital uh, fiction teaches us to be cautious about. Um, so it models the way we might readily give out information about ourselves in digitally mediated communication with people that we don't know or who, whose real or fictional status we're sort of unaware of. Um, the experience is enabled by the combination of technology, so our smartphone, and the personal relationship we have with that, and the communicative style of Karen and the use of the second person all working together to draw us into that text and, 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 and generate ontological resonance. And just to finish then, while I've, I've focused on Karen as exemplifying ontological resonance, I think we can extend this concept to other narratives. So, for example, locative interactive narratives um, in integrally sort of merge the actual and story world. So this is Zombies Run by Naomi Alderman and um, Rebecca Levine. This is um, a fiction that allows users to listen to an immersive audio drama while, while you're running, right? So it addresses the user in the second person, with uh, promotional material exemplifying the merging of story world and actual world. So it says, well, while you run to the perfect mix of heart pumping audio drama and pulse pounding songs from your own playlist, you collect supplies to grow your base back home. So this app fiction sort of combines storytelling and gameplay in a story world with the reader player's exercise regime in the actual world. So um, it's sort of running around, you know, your neighborhood, but you're hearing instructions um, hearing audio recordings with instructions from your comrades who are directing you through this imagined zombie infested metropolis and we're occasionally warned when zombies are gaining on us like and asking us to run faster so the world building elements in zombies run are, are actually sufficiently vague to allow the player to associate the descriptions with themselves for example um, hey i'm going to call you runner five because i don't know your name Right. Or they ask the runner to associate elements that you might be able to see in the actual world with the landscape that's described in the audio. So you should be able to see Robinson Hospital now, one of the buildings, Giffen Tower is the tallest in the abandoned city. So as you're running, you might sort of look and see a building and think, OK, I will. I that I'm going to say that's Robinson um, Hospital. And when each story mission is complete, the runner can click on an in-app map, which shows their route in the actual world. Um, so that is, you know, use, using an actual map of where you live or where you're running, but with fictional artifacts in, in an inventory that have been collected on the way. So like medical supplies and, um, and so on. And um, uh, you also have another map of the base, which shows the area that the, the, the runner and... Um, 
and your fictional comrades must must protect. So like Karen, the app uses the second person to address the reader as a character, but it also uses the reader's physical location, right? Creating this semi-fictional, semi-actual world narrative in which the reader's environment imbues um, the reader's kind of actual world with traces of the story world during the experience for sure and potentially after as well you know you sort of might remember we might remember that so it creates ontological resonance and i'd be interested in other examples uh, you have as i'm sort of developing this concept a bit further at the moment okay so i'm just coming to conclude now so digital fiction takes many forms and it allows or compels reader to interact with it to varying degrees and with different consequences. So the reader can be positioned squarely in the actual world, more pronouncedly in the story world or somewhere in between. Reader response research, which combines the analysis of textual features and reader constructions, allows us to develop concepts such as ontological resonance because we can pinpoint exactly how the text plays with the boundary between reality and fiction, linguistically and technologically. And reader response research in this context is vital to that because it provides empirical evidence for these exceptional experiences and, and therefore helps us to show how texts mean what they do. And I want to suggest then that absorption in another world or the merging of worlds, the reader having an effect on that world, or the uncanny feeling that something fictional has, in, has entered our world is one of the huge attractions of digital media. And it's something that digital fiction texts of all of all kinds play with to some extent. So they're offering very distinct narrative experiences and these possible and impossible worlds are what I think makes them so enjoyable. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you much, Alice. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, <clears throat> now, so uh, I suppose we, uh, yes, let's give it a hand. To start. Yes, uh, obviously. Thanks, um, everyone. Um, okay, uh, let's open uh, the room for uh, discussion. Uh, does anyone have a, a question to Alice? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So um, I was curious about how um, does it affect the player of this current game or app that it is some kind of a like a long distance relationship, but you're aware that there are you know multiple players interacting with the same person, so it's like personalized but for everyone. So did you focus on this area of this uh of this feature? Mm -hmm. Okay, Alice, did you hear that question? Partially, if you could just just repeat it, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, so the question was. Um, uh what about the fact that the app was the same for everyone so on the one hand it was personalized right like this the, the, the your name right the significant other name so it was basically just uh karen talking to you but at the yeah. same time the awareness right mm -hmm. that other people are experiencing the very same thing yeah right uh, because that, that that that's what it was like, right? That mm -hmm. that Karen is the same, the same kind of content for everyone. Yeah. Um, so, have you looked into that uh, that issue in your research? Um, okay, it was a bit broken up, but I think I I think I got the the the, the gist of the question. Um, that's a, it's a great point, isn't it? Because we're having what is feels potentially like quite a personalized experience knowing that um you know karen is, is is doing the same thing with other people so what what effects does that have on our on on the participant responses to it um thinking back to the data i mean nobody 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 talked about that um kind of conceptually if you're kind of philosophically if you see me but what but what participants were doing were comparing their relationship with Karen to each other's like they'd say oh she said this to me or do you remember when she said that or um and different things seem to uh, affect readers depending on their personal circumstances 
So, for example, there was one reader who um, uh, grew up in a particular town that um, Karen sort of met, mentioned at one point, and in their response, they were sort of saying, oh, I wonder if I've seen you down on the seafront before or something. Again, it was one of those kind of ontologically resonant things, like pretending she was real or not. Um, and yeah, people would sort of compare their experiences to it, but we didn't sort of focus on that specifically. I don't know if that answers your question. Please feel to, free to, to come back and ask me again or clarify, because I partially heard it. I think that's what you were talking about. But that, that was, I think, the issue that uh, people uh, experiencing uh, the world uh, of Karen yeah. one had uh, exceedingly personalized, right? calling us, messaging us, calling us by our names, but at the same time, the same experience being exactly the same for anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, if... If if um, if people in your surveys uh, yeah. did not address that issue, um, um, perhaps they were talking to each other about about certain because if they if they started the experience on the same day, so uh, supposedly they were receiving uh, the same notifications at the same hours, mm. so their experience was. You know, um, uh, uni, 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 unilinear, right? Uh, yeah. but they're discussing the experiences with specific on specific days on specific times. Um, do you have any any responses of this sort? Uh, no. So, so they would have uh, each experienced the the app over the 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 ten days individually, and um, we said, you know, don't don't conf don't talk to each other about this app until you okay. come to your book group okay. and discuss it together yeah so they they didn't do that in advance but it's curious that isn't it and I guess this is part of what I find so interesting and it's part of the fictionality is that they they know it's fictional they know Karen is not is, is ultimately being played by an actress they know it's not real right and uh all all, all their kind of book group um peers are experiencing the same thing right but nevertheless even though they know it's not real nevertheless it has that profound emotional response on them mm. and i just find that completely completely fascinating yeah yeah it's sort of uh it it it, it has this sort of parasocial uh, uh parasocial quality doesn't it yeah uh, yeah you, yeah you have a relationship with a fictitious character yeah and i talk <laughs> about that in the in the in the book that's coming out in terms in terms of it being a parasocial relationship yeah and how how that is um related to the fact that it is it, it's on something that belongs to you yeah, yeah. and one more thing when it comes to the, the 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 data the surveys um do you have data broken down according to gender uh, yeah. Because I there was this Denise guy, right? Yeah. Who who wasn't really falling for uh, the whole artifice, right? Yeah. yeah. There was this quote that that, that no, I mean, there was too artificial, something like this, right? Yeah. So there was a group of of of, um, of uh, female students, I, I presume, who were very much um, enjoying and feeling engaged with the story is there perhaps some kind of gender lines i don't know maybe i'm just to, to uh uh yeah. to say about it but it was kind of a kind of a gender differentiation between the approach uh into that story i don't know do, do you have mm. anything about that yeah good question good question thanks um so just before i answer it just to clarify so it wasn't a survey it was um it was a, a discussion. It was more resemble more like a focus group, I guess, okay. method oh. method, right? Um, and it wasn't with students either. It was with existing book groups in the, in the north of England. So these were people ranging from sort of their early twenties up to their late sixties, different professions, um, and it was it was we we it was purposive sampling. So we basically approached these people because the book groups that they were in had um, an interest in reading texts that were 
um, might be experimental or some of them sometimes would go and watch a film and then discuss that, you know, so they were interested potentially in different in different media. Um, so that's something about them. Uh, it A lot of book groups, um, I think research has shown that there are a lot of women in book groups, right? So the, and that played out actually in that we had more women participants than we had men. I can't say actually there was a difference in um in the the responses to Karen in that way from a gender perspective but what what I did notice is that there was in some ways and you would expect this because in in book groups uh, they form a sort of community of practice uh, in which they have particular ways of talking about books and then there will be um, roles established within those book groups and um so what happened is some 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 of the discussions in like one book group were quite dominated on the negative aspects of it right and then talked about the positive aspects a little bit one of the other book groups was like talking more about the kind of things that they enjoyed and then that was inflected a little bit by the, some of the stuff they they didn't like so much um and for example one one of the book groups talked well, actually, it was mentioned throughout all of the all of the five, but one talks quite a lot about the ethics of this app. Um, so, you know, is it ethical to do this? Is it ethical to dupe uh, people potentially? And I, and I talk about this in in the book that's coming out because um, even though Karen is listed on um, on these app stores as like a fictional experience, like entertainment, I think it's it's tagged as uh, in the in the empirical work that I did with reviews of that app some people mistook it for a real life coaching app so they started it thinking they, they were going to be they were being life coached and then sort of realized that they weren't so there was some discussion around the ethics of that um mm. as well and that you know and that was both men men and women so I can't I can't I, I don't I don't necessarily see that the men hated it, the women liked it, or you know, yeah. women experienced ontological resonance or whatever. But it's it's an interesting question, yeah. Okay, thanks. Anybody else from the from the, from the audience? Can I ask a question? Yeah, but sure. I yes. I heard. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Hi. Um. Thank you for for the talk. But uh, my point is, um, there is this game called Oxenfree, Oxenfree yeah. and I think it's like 23rd, uh, it's like early 2010s. And I think there was a trend in indie games at that point to do this trick of pulling your game info from Steam. And there is a scene in Oxenfree, which is basically about ghosts being trapped inside a radio on an island. But there's a moment in which the avatar has your gamer tag over the player, uh, over the over the avatar, and there is this kind of like I, I I it came up to me when you were talking about the feeling of something being too real, um, yeah. because there's sort of like this unexpected kind of violence in intruding on you as literally not even the player but the user of the platform that the games are being sold on. So this kind of I don't. Yeah. I'm sorry, this is not like a coherent question right now. Um, no. But also, it, it also kind of brought to mind the the matter of, um, I wonder if if the if the resonance would be like different if people didn't gi give their real name, um, because, uh, because that's also an interesting choice of like sometimes people create avatars of their actual names. Uh, sometimes they create a, 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 just a totally different. Sometimes they write a funny word, um, and yeah. it's kind of interesting how, because that was like a strong point of the immersion, right? Mm. So, so <laughs> I'm sorry I can't formulate it into a coherent question, but yeah. no, no, it's a great. Thank you for the example. I, if somebody could put it in the chat for me, because I, uh, the the connection is game, quite right? bad. You can so, name of the name of the game, Alice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the connection's quite bad, so it keeps coming in and out. But so just to clarify, so you oh thank you, thank you, Oxen Free. Okay, so so uh so the so the game somehow gets the um the user's Steam username, you say? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
and there's yeah. like the stores it's seen when the when the when the avatar has the gamer tag over them and like you you you, you like are scared like how did they get your yeah. player yeah 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 um yeah that that sounds actually pretty terrifying and i guess you know there's that is a merging of worlds isn't it unexpected um and also i guess that's that's some, also playing into something about like having access to your information um that you, you you might not you might not have sort of knowingly given um as well uh, i think i think there is something as well about um ontological resonance and um being being scared so i've got a kind of another example um which I, I can't go into any depth, but that was where people experienced the digital fiction in an installation, right? And then when they came out, they they saw somebody who uh, kind of had, they felt was part of the game or something, and they weren't, they weren't, but they sort of brought that experience into the into the real world as well. And I think fear can be generated by ontological resonance. But also your point about sort of role-playing sometimes or like giving your character, give, sorry, giving your avatar like not your name or something like that again in sort of a more extended analysis of this which is in the book what we found is that um the participants responded either authentically as themselves we call them the authentics right they just engaged in the experience as, as if they were themselves rejectors not interested just did it because they kind of had to and then role players who who kind of did it oh what i wonder what would happen if i clicked that response and that kind of thing um, so that that just brought that to mind for me um, as well. But that's such an interesting example. I'd like to I'd like to follow that up. So I really appreciate you you alerting me to that. Thank you. And this brings me to my question, <clears throat> uh, because the oxen free and Karen, um, you you categorize Karen as fiction, digital fiction. Oxen free yeah. is is a game. Okay. Know? Um, wh where where would be the uh no that the boundary right is there any mm -hmm. uh, boundary right it, in what sense karen is a piece of fiction literary fiction right and in in what sense is just you no know, an interactive cinema right or uh, maybe uh you know uh, some kind of immersive game like cox and free is mm -hmm. yeah i i i i totally get see what you're getting at and i think these are conversations we're having all of the time when we're dealing oh. with you know artifacts which are using um attributes and uh, devices uh, that we find in 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 other forms of art i mean i guess for me um and in the 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 kind of def definition of digital fiction that i um use which is which is which I revisit all the time, I would say, because people are doing new things and you have to make sure it still fits. But I think it's having that the difference between sort of a game and uh, and something being fictional is that kind of having that sort of strong narrative component, I think. So you know, uh, you know Tetris is a game, right? but that's not a piece of fiction. Yeah. Um, but then a, a game that has a strong narrative component. So you know, some people might call Karen a game um uh what you know so-called walking simulators or sort of uh you know narrative games they're still games in that you have a goal and that you but the goal is kind of getting the story if you like and then you know there 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 are kind of things in between so i think you sort of take it on each basis and you know that's interesting you mentioned cinema and interactive cinema because i've been looking at vr a lot more and what i'm seeing there is there are some vr pieces that are cinematic and actually you don't really have much interactivity there you can sort of scan around and look and you can walk around and and then there are others that have more of a, a reader in, or user involvement where you know you're clicking on things or you're you're taking things or you're getting bits of text you're uncovering the narrative so I mean, that's what makes it interesting, I think, is there's these different kind of um, forms of expression, artistic expression. And um, I think we just have to think about what they're doing. Uh, and, you know, it, is, is this something that we can look at as something that is a fictional experience? Yeah. But yeah, you're right to ask because we need to keep thinking about that.
Yeah, it's like an mm-hmm. anthological merge uh, in 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 this in this sense in terms of genre. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Another question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering because um, when we talk about fiction, it has a beginning and end. Yeah. But we talk about app, which the Karen example always want us to come back to that. So how uh, the app actually designed because we didn't experience it. Uh, to not be repetitive and uh, offer something new every, every time for the person who is experiencing to feel real. Because for me, with uh, this AI, chat GPT and so on, yeah, slightly different, but it's so repetitive after some point. So mm. how this app managed to not be repetitive so feels real? Yes. Um, I mean, I guess if you did it, multiple times i so how does it not feel repetitive so sorry just to clarify because again it just keeps glitching a little bit are you talking about people who might ex- do this more than once um sort of because if it's a fiction it has to be has a beginning and end what yeah. i'm wondering is does it have that like beginning and end yeah the app, as you mentioned always ask us to come back yeah Yes, it definitely has a beginning and it has an end. Yeah. So um, I just remind myself of how many episodes are. I think there's something like 17 video calls in the end. Uh, it takes over. It, 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 um, the, the story is spread over about eight days. So there is an end and there is a beginning. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like, you know, serialized fiction, basically. Sometimes you get like three calls a day, quite short. Another day you might get one. I mean, they're very, they're very short. They're about between, th- you know, three and five minutes each. Um, so it it's kind of like a, yeah, a serialized fiction, really. So it doesn't, I mean, again, this is anecdotal. For me, it doesn't feel repetitive because there is a narrative there is a story and you know without giving away what happens um there are there are things that happen there are sort of other characters that come in um that we're really sort of following uh, Karen's life and there's a couple of well there's another character who comes in um who who speaks to us at one point so it is quite i find it i find it quite entertaining i mean it's it's tragic it's tragic uh, i find it quite entertaining but also, I actually have, I, I have done this experience quite a lot, right? Because I'm interested in examining it. But interestingly, when I first did it, I had to make the decision. Am I doing, am I going to do this as myself, right? Or am I going to sort of play a role? And I've done both of those things. And I found that enjoyable. I found that enjoyable to sort of, or choose choose a response that I wouldn't normally choose or, um, you know, uh, that feels controversial to me um and also some of the re some of the um questions that she asks right and then we get these multiple choice answers you get quite sarcastic responses to the questions it's almost like trying to second guess what a particular reader would be feeling at that point which i personally found quite humorous um so yeah i, I mean i love this app right but i i see and i have evidence from our data that it is not is definitely not for everyone yeah thank you so much thank you thanks uh any more questions i have a question can you, could you please come over um, yes i oh no, no hi thank hi. you for- um, my question is maybe it's like very general, but uh, basically I wanted to ask you: if, Do you think um, this kind of app or game or literature is or fiction? Sorry, is like a, a symptom of a larger, maybe not issue, but you know, an an aspect of our contemporary world because we are talking here. You mentioned here the parasocial relationships, right? Yeah. And also I'm thinking about um what what part fan fiction so like when people were writing you know about um celebrities for example like Harry Styles and th- then instead of like putting the name of a character they would put um why 
N, which was uh, for your name. So basically, when you were reading it uh, as a reader, you were supposed to like kind of put your own name in there. So the story became about you. And usually, yeah. of course, it was like a romance story between you and like a, a well-known celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. So again, another um, way of forming a parasocial relationship, mm -hmm. let's say. And also, because what I'm thinking is like, does this say something about our um, ability or way in which we form um, intimacy and, you know, basically just human, human connections? Because right here, we have a proof that um, I think your study showed this, that we can form a emotional connection with someone who doesn't exist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, um, so is, is this part of our, great question, great question. Um, so is this part of our sort of current condition or, or whatever you're saying? Is this part of like how, how things are in contemporary life? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess so. It's not it's not my area necessarily, but I mean, I guess p the digital sorry the technology will um, always be there, and these things historically did happen. Parasocial relationships people would form with radio hosts, people on the telly, you know. Um, but I think there is something about the uh, about the, the digital technology that makes it different. So one is the interactive element, potentially, and that kind of putting yourself in that loop. But the other is uh, this ontological ambiguity that can be created in digital media. So like sometimes you can interact, you could interact with somebody and you don't know if that's like AI or a real person or somebody pretending to be somebody different. Um, and I'm interested in that. Uh, that context and but I know you are and I defer to you on this as I'm getting started on this but in terms of this being like a post-digital context in which you know I'm talking about the fictional world and the real world right in this this distinction but actually in in a kind of post-digital context the, the idea being that actually that distinction is less pronounced now because it's just the world um so I think that is also you know uh, um, that is also relevant here in terms of those relationships that we can form with people what what does real mean in that context um, mm. yeah but thanks that's that's brilliant and uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm also made me think about that yeah yeah because I'm you know always uh, I mean not always but it is a topic on my mind basically nowadays yeah. you know especially when it comes to the internet and how um, it's so catered toward our um, preferences like for example every like every time you go on Instagram every user of Instagram sees a very different app right so it's all very personalized but on the other side it's not so you know yeah. like Karen right and the uh, yeah yeah and I guess um yeah, it, you're right. It's very personalized, but it's also not. And I guess that so I guess that's to do with what the user is doing with that and how they how they are responding to that um, and and what um, what effect that has on them, whether they take that as being personalized and feels that it is relevant to them and about them and they embrace that, um, whereas other other people won't. So I guess that's to do with kind of disposition or. um willingness to to embrace that in some way or or not um but yeah it's 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 fascinating it's completely fascinating thank you thank you thanks and maybe the last question um from Giorgio go ahead Giorgio oh thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to post the question and thank you so much um Alice for the for the uh, talk um since um steam well uh, games were mentioned um and i i was i was thinking about this mobile game that i suppose you know which is called bury me my love oh, i yeah. was thinking yeah i was thinking of, of the extent because you didn't mention it in the in the lecture of 
let's say, mimetic illusion in order to get this ontological ambiguity or ontological resonance. Because Bury Me, My Love uh, works exactly, exactly, very much like Karen with text messaging that intrudes in, okay. in, in your daily life, etc., etc., except it is drawn. Uh, and and there is um, there is an interface that simulates a uh, text messaging app, but when you get pictures, for example, you know that the characters are drawn. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how much that mm -hmm. uh, lack of mimesis actually counts in because you you did mention several times, right? It's about uh, a linguistic connection to the users. It's about the structural connection to the users, interactivity or whatever, drawing in and and inventing the real world. But then there's always this perceptive elements right yeah thank you so much yeah thank you this is a brilliant question thank you so much i haven't um i'm aware of bury me my love but i haven't I haven't done it myself so that's that's really you know thank you for explaining how it works yeah that you're absolutely right and that that i think is to do with the distinction between um high visual modality and low visual modality so you know some 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 sort of media has high visual modality we might say karen is high visual modality because it's this um it's this recording it's it's motion video um and then other things have low visual modality like the drawings that you describe and yeah you're you're absolutely right that's got to play a part there hasn't it um i mean it whether um that would affect the extent of people's um emotional response to it because i guess there's emotional response there's um you know ontological resonance would be another thing um whether the modality affects readers ability to engage in those different ways i guess you'd have to look at you'd have to test because actually what, what it seems to me is that some people and this has been found you know i mentioned this game transfer phenomenon or it or to the Qatari did the study of like people gamers who like hear bits from the game or like almost feel like they're in the game when they're out of it and that seems to me it's almost like some people are sort of predisposed to that not not essentially predisposed to it like some people enjoy it some people embrace it some people allow it sort of thing so maybe I don't know because I haven't done the study, but I wonder if some people, even though Bury Me My Love has that more low visual modality that's drawn rather than it being a sort of recording, whether some people would still experience those emotional, strong emotional responses, maybe, uh, you know, feeling like there's an ontological resonance despite that. So some people would have a more profound effect than others, perhaps. Um, but that's given me a lot to think about. Thank you. That's That's really... A great question. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I think we need to wrap up. Uh, so thank you very much for everyone present in the classroom and in the in the Zoom. Um, uh, thank you, Alice, for talking to us today. Pleasure. It was it was fascinating and a very thought-provoking. I have millions of questions. You might find me emailing you with some of my questions. Right? Please, I'd like to talk to you about your inter intermediality uh, work, actually, as well. So, um, Perfect. Yeah, and, um, and I would like you all to invite you uh, to the next talk in the New Media Series. It is the 27th of October, 11.30 Warsaw time. My guest will be Scott Redberg from the University of Borgen. So uh, see you then. See you in two weeks. Uh, take care. Have a good day, Alice, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.